Yeah, so if Kennedy Johnson, you see I have Warren there, kind of have to throw in Earl Warren with the, the court, so I put him in this section. All right, the 1960 election. This is a, a monumental point in political science history. First of all, the Republican, the candidate was the vice president for Eisenhower, Richard Nixon. Now, he went in, in 1959, they had a what was called the kitchen debate. He went with the Soviet Union and met with Khrushchev. All right, the premier would be kind of like the president, but of uh, the Soviet Union. So we send our vice president there and negotiate with them. I had a question, why does that matter? Why does it matter that Nixon, as a vice president, goes and meets with the leader of the Soviet Union and they make it look like they're, they're meeting in a kitchen? Because people are scared of the communism and they think that like, there's like, some kind of like, relationship between him and Khrushchev. Okay, and that's kind of it. I mean, it's, it's, he is doing something presidential. He is one negotiated. Where a lot of times, especially at that time, vice presidents didn't do a whole lot of things important. It was kind of a joke along the way that the vice president went went around the world to funerals that somebody wasn't that wasn't important enough for the president or the secretary of state to go to. All right, they died. Um, your lifetime, you have seen three of our most powerful vice presidents in in the history of the United States because. Right now, Joe Biden has a lot more responsibilities than what historically has been done. Dick Cheney had a lot more, and Al Gore before that. So, I mean, this is where, where before this time, it wasn't a position. But Nixon was given that. And so he comes in, and we're in the height of the Cold War, the, remember the massive retaliation. So you've got a person that's involved with it. Seems like he would have an advantage. Um, there. And this is where, I mean, and you see this picture, I mean, him sticking his finger in his chest, and I mean, he's, he's a tough guy. And we're kind of, and that's where, again, in the middle of a, of a Cold War one. The Democrats, they nominate John F. Kennedy. Now, John F. Kennedy chooses as his vice presidential running mate, Lyndon Baines Johnson, which is actually extremely important. Where is Johnson from? Not the North. South. Alabama. Yeah. Georgia. Georgia. He's from Texas. And he's Democrat. So it is a Southern, and this is where you have to realize the old Democrats. Now, we're after the Dixiecrats. The Democrats in the South, they're still not sure where to go. Do they go with the Republicans? Do they go with the Democrats? And they're kind of falling back and forth. And this kind of shows here that the South still pretty much is Democrat. And this is where choosing a vice president can be real important. If, if Kennedy would have chosen probably a northerner or someone from out west, probably would not have won the South here. And this election ended up being extremely close. Now, Kennedy had one thing that was used against him somewhat in the South. Catholic. Right, he's Catholic. We had never elected a Catholic. He is actually in the United States our only Catholic we have ever elected. What, what, was the, what was the fear of electing a Catholic? He'd respond to the Pope instead of the people. Religious. Yeah, the religious side of the Pope is seen as the head of the Catholic Church. The fear was if the Pope tells, is telling, if you're a good Catholic, you're doing what the Pope tells you. Well, if you're the president, then the Pope will be in charge of, of the country. Was now, in political science, this was also our first televised debate. We'd had debates before. Uh, not much before this time, but this is where we really had this debate. And in this debate, we have people that listen to it on the radio, the old medium. And according to people that listen on to the, to the radio, the majority of them said Nixon won the debate. Those that watched it on TV said JFK won the debate. So if we kind of look at that, who probably truly won the debate when it comes to an argument? Nixon. Yeah, Nixon. But more people watched it on TV than on the radio, and this kind of was, and that first one changed it. Um, if you remember, Nixon was the one that gave the checker speech, and he used the TV. Well, in this case, JFK learned how to use the TV better. Yeah. I, I'm taking a speech class, and we watched a video on about their debate. And, they, and the person that was talking about it said that like 
Nixon was like a man's man and he didn't want to wear makeup or anything and, and then Kennedy was like oh put all this makeup on me to make me look better and like he just presented himself better because Nixon was like sweating really bad and was like so nervous and everything. Nixon had been really sick the last several days before that time and you know how sometimes when you've been really sick I mean you look horrible okay and that's where Nixon looked that way. Um, even this picture Nixon looks stiff in the chair. <coughs> Kennedy's got his legs crossed looks relaxed. Um, the part about the makeup, yeah, Nixon was a man's man. He's not going to put on makeup. Kennedy, all right, go ahead and do it. What you have to realize also, TV at that time was black and white. If you were pale or extremely dark, it made you more extreme. And so for Nixon, he was a bit pale. It made him look even more like a ghost. Um, and so that's where the makeup really kind of made, made a difference. Um, and and it, we and now I mean it's really bad when you kind of watch things for debates. There's a lot of theatrics that goes that gets involved. I love watching Saturday Night Live after presidential debates because they're gonna they're going to get on there. The 2000 election was that was that way. Um, Al Gore was an incredible debater, and he knows all the little tactics. Okay, it's some of you that don't know what things for debate. You don't decide to yell over a person. Uh, with things. You don't want to be too mean, but what you do to kind of show, and Al Gore was doing this when, when George Bush would say something he didn't like, he'd be a, <sighs> all right, give a big old sigh. Y'all are teenagers, you know how to do that. Your parents are telling you something, you roll your eyes and you sigh. Okay, yeah, whatever you say. Okay, and that's where there's certain things that you learn to do. Um, now, I mean, they come through with a commission. When, when George Bush was debating um, John Kerry. They made sure that when they were standing up, they were on far ends of the stage from each other because John Kerry was about three or four inches taller. And the psychological side, if somebody sees two people by each other, uh, there that they would that you have a person talking down, and people psychologically then think the other is superior to each other. So the Republicans made sure that they were spread apart the stage. And I don't know if I bet they probably even and had it where George Bush was on a little bit of a lift, even though they were on opposite sides um, there. But there's all kinds of things that, that go with it. Um, there. But at that time, it wasn't known with that. But Kennedy was able to use those things. The reason why this debate ended up mattering so much is that was the closest election we had had since the Compromise of 1877. It's, it came out so much. If, one per the average was if one person in every precinct would have had a vote that, that voted for Kennedy would have voted for Nixon, Nixon would have ended up winning. I mean, it was that close of an election uh, that, that we have. I mean, you see the popular vote here, it is 50 50 pretty much for the popular vote. Um, and so, I mean, that's why one debate might have made the difference, especially when it was the first one. Okay, saw so some of the with the video. Kennedy gets into office. One of the first things he's told is the Eisenhower administration was planning a group, and actually here in Florida, down at University of Miami, some of the Cuban refugees that had left when Castro took over Cuba were down in Miami. They were training them to take back over Cuba. So it was a giant plan that they had. Um, another thing in psychology that you may have heard of sometimes is what's called groupthink. You ever get with a group of people and you start talking about something and you have doubts in your mind, but you're afraid to say anything because you're afraid you're the only one that thinks that way. So there's seven, eight, ten people around, and you just kind of, yeah, yeah, you agree with it. And afterwards, when they went back and talked about this, they figured out that when talking to different people, yeah, well, there was this part I really didn't think, and this part, but nobody spoke up to do this. And that was one thing that, that like the video said, Kennedy had a learning curve. He learned, he told people, speak up. If you feel there might be something wrong, let's not make the mistake afterwards. All right? It's, um, it, you know, sometimes you go to the other extreme. You have everybody say every little thing that could go wrong. Okay, that you have. But realistically, with Bay and Pigs, it was a major mess up. Um, those of you in the military, it was major foobar. Okay? <laughs> tell those of you that know the military, that screwed up beyond all repair. Okay, except for screwed, it's not the first word um, in here. But that's, but this is where it was a major mess up. 
And it wasn't like, oh, this one person messed up or this one group messed up. We, the CIA landed, landed, landed the expatriates there. The Air Force was supposed to go and give them air cover. One of the little mistakes they had was the timing was wrong. The Air Force was coming from Texas in central time zone. So they were showing up an hour late. I mean, you think about something like that. I mean, so you land soldiers thinking they're, are, they're going to have air cover come in and they're not there for another hour. Okay? The Navy messed up, the Air Force made stuff, the CIA, I mean, you name it, it was all mess ups that we had. And if it makes it look like little Cuba ends up defeating the United States. It wasn't our soldiers, but they were basically our help with everything. So Cuba shows up, uh, up. It's a major embarrassment for the United States. Are we getting very weak when it comes to communism? 90 miles away, little communist Cuba is taking care of us. Um, and here's where you see the political cartoon. I mean, this is where it's kind of seen. It blows up in his face. And you can bet if you're president, that's one of the very first things happens in it. Now, what president's administration had started planning the Bay of Pigs? Eisenhower. Yeah, Eisenhower. Would it be real easy for Kennedy to say, ah, well, you know, they were already planning it? Or could he have gone and said, it was the Air Force's fault? It was the Navy, this one. What did Kennedy do? He took the blame. I mean, he went on TV and said, it's my fault. I mean, you saw that little quote. All right, about defeat as an orphan. Everybody take, wants to take credit, all right, when things are good. But nobody wants to take blame. And he said, it's my fault. Now, over the next couple of months, if you want to know whose fault it was, all you got to do is watch the news or actually go on, on the newspaper, not on the front page. It would be like page 18, and you would see this general resigned. This Air Force general got demoted. This person in the CIA, all right, resigned. And you could find out, ah, this is the one screwed up. Here's one screwed up. But Kennedy didn't come out and say, that, this general messed up. That one did it. Okay? He came and said, it's my fault. After, after the Bay of Pigs, we end up coming in basically a little different direction. Now, kind of looking and connecting them together. President Truman, our idea was containment. Except for when we were containing communism, was it working? Oh. China falls, North Korea falls. Okay, so then we kind of get to the next idea where we're going to do with Eisenhower. We're going to take it to the brink of war with massive retaliation. But during Kennedy's administration, we will then kind of look at things and say we need to go in a different direction. And realistically, a lot of our the way our army is today comes about. We come up with a bunch of special forces. Most of you know the Navy SEALs because of what they have done the last few years with Bin Laden and shooting pirates and things like that. That is where Kennedy said we're going to have it. We're going to have a lot of times we're going to have things happen like in Cuba where we're not going to need a massive army. We're going to need a couple hundred very well trained soldiers. And that kind of starts with special forces on um, there. And kind of the idea you can't use a nuclear weapon for every single situation. Next thing that he would have would be called the Alliance for Progress. The Truman Doctrine was, I'm going to try, the, sorry, Eisenhower, for his, a lot of his philosophy, we, our CIA was going into Latin America, and if they were looking to be communists, the CIA helped overthrow governments. And we had once again had come down, and even though we won't call it this, it was almost like the big stick policy. If our little brothers to the south aren't doing what we want, then we'll come in and let you make you do what we want. We end up going more with what was like Roosevelt's plan with the good neighbor policy. We're going to try to help you out. And we'd actually, we sent aid, financial aid, going to South America, Central America. Uh, some of you might look at this and say, wait a minute, that map's wrong. Wait a minute, that's wrong. <laughs> is it wrong? Or is it just our perspective? And here's where some of that they, they looked at to try to say, okay, it's not everything coming down from, from us. Um, and 
this is where you kind of look. We gave aid, martial aid, to Europe. We rebuilt Japan. What did we do to our neighbors? Yeah. Help them out. Well, we have them down. And oh. that's where Kennedy was saying, well, maybe we should help out our neighbors. Why is it that Cuba decides to become communist right under our nose? Okay, we spent all this time trying to make sure Europe didn't, yet right under our nose it happened. And then we have the Peace Corps. What is the Peace Corps? Those are, I thought you volunteer hours. Okay, they're volunteers. Here's where you kind of look at things, and it is a little bit different. And for those baby boomers, and this is part of the idea that Kennedy had. That generation of baby boomers that are now getting to the point that they are, that they are in high school, they're college age. They have been the richest in the history of the world of any group of people. Remember that one time right after World War II, uh, the average American family was 15 times richer than the average European family? Oh, I remember that. And so they, they grew up with that. Well, here's part of Kennedy's idea. Give back to the world. All right, once you, after you go to college or you get out of high school, all right, you've got a degree, you've got a skill, go spend a couple of years in South America or Africa and help them out. Does that sound very American? All right. Most of you, when you get out of college, all right, heck no, I'm getting a job. I'm going to get a new car. I've been driving this old car for six years. Okay. okay. And some of you will say, I'll have to pay off my college loan. Now, the Peace Corps is still around today. Uh, what's kind of funny is the Peace Corps today, a lot of the people going into the Peace Corps today are actually the same generation that was the original one. <laughs> because a lot of those baby boomers, they're retiring, but do they really want to go and do a retirement lifestyle? Maybe they don't want to golf and travel around. Maybe they want to give back. And so a lot of these baby boomers are actually going to Peace Corps today to go and spend a couple of, year, of years overseas doing something and kind of helping out areas. And I have a question, how are these ideas different? What's different about what was happening in the 50s before that? It was like everybody was involved. Yeah, we weren't getting involved in those places in the war. All right, the 50s, remember the materialism, consumerism, okay? It's, but now, yeah, we are. We're getting involved. We're helping out other places. Okay, I'm working. It, again, it's a little bit different attitude. All right, foreign problems. The Berlin Wall. The Berlin Wall that you all probably have in your mind was not the original wall. Overnight, threw up basically a chain link fence with barbed wire on the top. Okay, soldiers came in and basically they put it in. And it, was, it was literally overnight. Anyone know why Khrushchev would be doing that? Some to be communist. What? He wants control. He wanted control. So people wouldn't leave the country. Right. See, in East Germany, now, the idea of communism is, is good overall. Everybody's equal. But again, are all of you equal? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Austin, he's living in East Germany. He is an engineer. Nice. Dylan is... A short order cook. Oh, damn okay, he <laughs> is cutting up the food so that he's a the other Dylan, the chef, could actually cook it because he's going to cut and chop the food up for him. <laughs> but you are all equal. So in East Germany, the idea is pretty much our engineer is living the same way as our person that is the prep for a restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Meanwhile, if you go across the street there into West Berlin, you're going to be paid for, in capitalism, what your skills are. Do you want to stay in East Germany? So what was happening o over time in Brain East Germany dream. for their skilled people? Brain Brain Brain. Brain. Yeah, they go into West Berlin and see you. All right, I'm just going to make money. And so they were, East Germany was having a brain drain. They're skilled people. They're doctors. They're engineers. They're, I mean, even if you were a person with technical skills, your best welders, why stay in the communist country when you can get paid more? So Khrushchev put up the fence to stop that. 
uh, there, and that's where the Y com comes in here. Um, families were separated overnight. Now, over time, this wall would become that giant wall that you picture in, in your mind. Okay, because again, this goes up in the early 60s. Here's Kennedy. He flies into West Berlin. West Berlin is completely now surrounded by this fence, East Germany. He flies into West Berlin. Does that take some guts? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're pretty much surrounded by, again, we're not in a war with him, but the Cold War, but you're surrounded by the communists. And he gives a speech, Hick ein Berliner. What does that mean? Yes, I'm a jelly donut. <laughs> and the Germans, they love that. I'm a jelly donut. Is that really what he said? No. He mispronounced something. And remember, in this room, you cannot, you cannot make fun of somebody for mispronouncing something. Um, I guess for Berliner, if you have the mispronunciation a little bit different, instead of saying, I am a fellow Berliner, all right, it, it's a, some sort of jelly pastry. <laughs> so, yes, Kennedy gives his I am a jelly donut speech. <laughs> but the people in Berlin knew that he was not talking about I am a jelly donut, but they knew that he was saying, I'm with you in your fight for this. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> so, did he have to have speech in my Yes. He flies again. It is. Yes, and he, I mean, again, he was trying, I mean, trying to speak. All right, the space race. We do have a little bit of background before for the space race with Sputnik, but we really, we're still kind of looking at things. One thing that Kennedy actually refers to in the, in the 1960 um, election and debates against Nixon is that we have a missile gap. And what Kennedy ends up doing is gives it, gives it a goal for us to go to the moon by the end of the decade. Now, if we're worried about a nuclear war, why are we suddenly going to go to the moon? In case we blow up the planet? In case we blow up the planet. Intimidation. Prove that we're awesome. Intimidation. Say ha ha in your face so you can win. If we can send a man to the moon, we can send a missile anywhere. And that's actually what. I, here's where Kennedy was an incredible politician. If you tell people that we want to build a rocket so we can go and blow up any place in the world we want. Now some of you are like, yeah, let's do it. Other people are like, I'm not so sure of that. But we use that same technology that we go to send a person to the moon, bring them back and land them safely. That means that we can go on that same type of rocket, we send it up into the atmosphere, and we put it down anywhere in the world with a nuclear warhead. That's what the space race was actually about. It was for military purposes. But you've got people behind it. We made it where? I mean, our, our astronauts were stars. They had to be really careful. They were very careful with selecting their astronauts. They wanted to make sure that they got clean cut guys. Um, they didn't, I mean, when you see the pictures of them, and as we go through the 60s, and you all start thinking of the, hip, the hippies, all right, our astronauts were not those guys. I mean, they are clean shaven, they have a short haircut, they're dressing, all right, at the military wall. I mean, this is where they, they want, they are kind of seen in that, that way. Um, but it was for military reasons. Now, did we get any other benefits out of the space program? Besides Tang, of course. Y'all they grew up in the tang. 70s and 80s when they had to drink Tang was really all big. But Tang was something there. But there's, there's all kinds of little things that, that we have had. Um, some of you use a GPS. All right, that comes about from the, these programs. All right, now, to kind of see the difference where you have to trick Americans into wanting something, did the Soviets worry about going to the moon? No. Why go to the moon? That's a waste of money kind of doing that promotion for things. Um, now, there's other things that they had and kind of, Americans were having a problem with some of the pins that they were using because gravity, a ballpoint pen, uses gravity. You know, if you ever write something like on the wall and then the pen doesn't work for a little bit and you have to have it down, okay? Well, our pens weren't working out of space with, with gravity, so we had to basically invent an anti-gravity pen. Why not just use a pencil? That's what the Soviets did. They put a pencil on. Okay, I mean, that's what kind of the Soviets' idea was. But for Americans, it's where 
Right? We, we overcame those problems. Now, we will end up having, and these are, it's trivia, but trivia to know. Well, first of all, NASA would be established in Florida. We have the Kennedy Space Center, which, to kind of tell where Florida felt about John F. Kennedy, when, we, when it was made after his death to change it from Cape Canaveral to Cape Kennedy, there was a big backlash in Florida saying, no, we're not going to do that. So that's why it still is Cape Canaveral, and then it's the Kennedy Space Center that is there. Mission Control in Houston. Why, why are we putting part of it in Florida and part in Texas? It's not they can't get blown up all one time. That's one reason. All right. And there is that if there was to be a nuclear weapon, we scatter things around so it, you have it. Another reason would be political. Okay, it's kind of a payback for Texas that supported them in the election. Uh, 1969, Neil Armstrong, not Lance Armstrong, Neil Armstrong, Lance flies his bike around now. Uh, Neil Armstrong lands on the moon. Now, Kennedy gave us a goal to be on the moon by the end of the decade. Did we achieve the goal? Mm -hmm. Is there very, very often that a government says we want to do this, that we actually do it and do it in the time that they say? So maybe this is where kind of going back to the whole thing. Yeah. All right, the Cuban Missile Crisis, the closest that we get to World War III. Um, you saw in the video, and probably see the same pictures, we see that the Soviets are giving the, the Cubans the, basically what would be for a, so a missile base. Now, Kennedy declares a quarantine of Cuba. What does that mean? We keep them in, they can't get out. Yeah, nothing's allowed in and out, which is a blockade. Why didn't he just use the word blockade? Because blockade is an act of war. Yeah, blockade is a true act of war. And we weren't blockading them, we were quarantining them, which all we did is use semantics. We were doing an act of war. We have our soul, our ships are out, and you can kind of see in this map, all right, nothing can go. We had air patrols, and their ships were coming right towards Cuba. Um, and they were bringing supplies in. The whole question was, were they going to turn around? Were they going to stop? Well, we say they are supposed to stop. Um, there are a lot of little things that happened, some with their generals, some with our generals, that we had some firing, not truly at each other. The Soviets would fire things above our <coughs> ships, trying to get us to fire back. We have people that are that are advising Kennedy. You must, okay, you must basically take out Cuba. All right, <coughs> launch a preemptive attack. And Kennedy does it, and what we end up with is this secret deal that is made back and forth because Kennedy cannot talk to Khrushchev, and thus we would end up with, with a deal made that the Soviets would remove those missiles, and we would later on, the next year, we would remove our missiles that we already had in Turkey. A lot of people didn't like that idea when they found out about it. Some people said it was already being planned, and Kennedy tricked Khrushchev there. But that's where we're at. You'll see the phrase, Khrushchev blink. Kennedy and Khrushchev stared at each other. Now, the reason why Cuba's here, you look at this, of where Cuba is, they could have a first strike capability over us. Well, basically where those circles are before we could launch something. Um, and those, basically the first, two, the first two circles there, Washington, D.C., before we would know what hit us, Washington, D.C. could have been taken out. And that's why it was kind of a weird thing. Cuban Missile Crisis. One of the first things is we established the hotline. You might hear some things about the red phone. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, one of the problems that we had was Kennedy could not talk to Khrushchev, not directly. They had to go from ambassador to ambassador. And part of the problem they had is both of them had military leaders saying, It's really annoying. Let's nuke them. Let's go to war. So that is why they ended up after this time saying, we need to have something that before we decide to essentially start World War III, let's talk to each other. All right? Even though we might hang up the phone and then put in the launch codes, at least we have a chance to do something to talk directly to each other uh, um, at that time. And that's where the hotline was established. And this is where, again, the, the red phone, I don't know if that is the actual red phone that they have, but it's a red phone. But that's where, kind of in the White House, the idea that there's a red phone for 
to have direct lines. The other thing I looked at and said, all right, we've been in this nuclear arms race. Let's slow down. And what they did is we had it where, where a bunch of stations signed the ne nuclear test ban. And it wasn't that you couldn't test a nuclear bomb, but you couldn't do it in the air. Realistically, then you are trying to contain it. Like North Korea re has, has recently gone and they've had, they were, re there was, they could tell that there was an earthquake. Well, it happened from where they, they did an explosion and they are testing, but at least it is a contained area. We're not releasing all this radiation into the atmosphere. Um, but this is where we start having the steps. We're going to have other talks go for, for arms race um, along the way. And what ends up happening, though, is we have another way. OK, you just put it right there. Um, we end up having the space race. All right, and, and this is where for, for Kennedy, where he would, he would say for us to try to get to the moon first. Again, the idea was not, oh, we're number one. We put the flag there. Okay. The idea is let's get our technology to be number one in the world when it comes to that. Um, right. <coughs> Notice everything we've had so far with Kennedy has been his foreign affairs. He does have a domestic plan. Now, put star circles around new frontier. Remember how we had square deal. We had new deal. We have the fair deal. Well, we have the new frontier. All right, and this is where his domestic policy. But if you look at this, he's continuing a lot of the ideas that Truman had in this fair deal. Aid to education. Truman called for that. Urban renewal. Truman didn't really call as much for this, but this is where, once we get past the 1950s, Harrington's book had shown with the other America that a lot of the cities were decaying on there. One of the things that Kennedy kept pushing for was civil rights. Was Congress listening to him? No. No, they wouldn't. And this is something that we kind of see time and time again for Congress. In all reality, Kennedy did not have hardly any success when it came on the domestic front. And, and you can say a lot of things are just like Truman. Okay, There were things that he said, let's do this. Congress told him no. Okay, and so that is where, but there were a few highlights. First of all, he appointed his brother as the Attorney General. Now the Attorney General is our top cop. In government, we have our separation of powers. The executive branch is in charge of enforcing the laws. Well, the Attorney General <coughs> is basically your top person for enforcing those laws. And what ended up happening was after the Birmingham um, protests that, that we had and then where people were pe peacefully having a parade. You saw some of the images yesterday where they were, I mean, using fire hoses on people, uh, having attack dogs for people that were just going to say in segregation in Birmingham. Um, this is where John F. Kennedy said, no, we're not going to have this. And he sent Robert Kennedy down to start enforcing some of the civil rights laws that were already there. And this, this would be just to start two things with Kennedy. But besides that, he had, had, he had actually sat out a lot of the things that he'd done before. The Housing Act of 1961, it didn't do a lot, but this started the process of we got poor in the cities, we got poor in the urban or the rural areas. Again, Michael Harrington's book, The Impact That It Would Have. What's kind of odd here? Remember trickle-down economics? Who did trickle-down economics? Yeah, the Andrew Mellon and the Republicans. What party is Kennedy? A Democrat. But he is one that he pushes for trickle-down economics. When the economy looked like it was slowing down, and it ended up getting the economy going again. And it's actually it's one of the times that's pointed to in history as trickle-down economics being successful. And again, it was under a Democratic president, in this case for Kennedy, um, that yeah. The minimum wage, $1.25 an hour. Uh, of course, if we were to put inflation in, has the minimum wage kept up with inflation? I don't know exactly what it would be, but I know at one time I'm looking at things, 
if we kept up with inflation from this time in the early 60s, and over 50 years ago, the minimum wage right now would be somewhere between 10 and $11 an hour. So we have not kept up over in recent decades um, with that. And that's where they're trying to have this. Remember, Truman was able to get a minimum wage. Eisenhower does it. All right, we keep increasing the minimum wage at that time. The key thing about this is these are, I mean, he had some success. Most of his ideas were kind of pushed aside by Congress. But then when he would die, it actually would help him. Because our next president and Johnson, his programs would take a lot of Kennedy's ideas, and Johnson would be able to get it through Congress. Um, there's two reasons why Johnson would be successful. The first is he would use a guilt trip because he would turn around when he went to Congress and said, this is what your president, that was slain, wanted. You need to vote for the Civil Rights Bill. That is what he wanted. The other thing was Johnson had come from the House of Representatives. Johnson was a, you can either do it in a positive way, a crafty politician or a sneaky politician. He knew how to twist arms. He knew how to get people to, to vote, and he would come in there. I mean, literally, Johnson, get in their face if you disagreed with them. All right, get in their face and say, you will do this. All right, pretty much bullying some of the people into, you will vote for this way uh, there. Otherwise, if you run for a campaign, I'm going to go against you. Mm -hmm. All right, I had this question in the very beginning. Why is Kennedy thought he was a great president by so many when he was only in office for two and a half years, basically a thousand days? Why is he such a great president? Because his idea and his like belief for how America should be. All right, his ideas. What? He was charismatic and the idea of having the people give back to the country rather than taking. Okay, some of those ideas are different. I mean, giving back to the country. And here's where, with those ideas, one of this is, if you ever hear the term Camelot. Now, what is Camelot usually used in history? Yeah, King Arthur's Court. And the idea was that Kennedy comes back in. We go from Eisenhower, who was, Eisenhower was kind of like your, your nice grandfather figure. Um, his, the first lady was Mamie Eisenhower, and she definitely seems like this nice grandmotherly type person. Then we go to our first lady, who was Jackie Kennedy. All right, who was I mean, seen as just an absolute beautiful woman. She used that. I mean, it's, and she was elegant with, with this. She went and she gave on TV, she used TV, and gave a tour of the White House at Christmas. All right, and I mean, it was something that for women, I mean, this is like, they felt like, like if, if you have your house and you have visitors come, sometimes like, here, let me show you around. All right, let me show you your house. Well. She does that on TV, all right? She was a hostess in that way. They're young, they have children while they are, they are in an office. Um, by the way, some of you, this is a famous photograph of JFK's son as the funeral procession was going by after he, he died. His son then does a salute. Supposedly, it was all on his own. Um, I guess I'm a little bit cynical and thinking there's probably someone politician-wise saying, hey, all right, when this comes by, salute when your dad's, when, the, when the, the horse drawn carriage comes by with that, with the flags on it, do a salute. I mean, I, maybe he truly did do it on his own, but it made for a great moment politically. And one thing about the Kennedys was they were a very political family. All right, some people will look and say, how did John F. Kennedy have basically these extramarital um, relationships when, 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 I mean, he has, has I mean, a beautiful wife. All right, he has all these things going for him. What did she not know about? Well, she was a politician herself. Okay, it was almost like a political marriage that she looked the other way. Um, the video that you saw yesterday said that Kennedy was really good at um, basically putting everything in compartments. Here's my political life, here's my personal life, and people at that time ignored a lot of things. That quote that we have from his speech, from where Taylor had said, it is a different idea. Uh, as much as you like things given to you, do you appreciate things more when you've earned it? And this is where, I mean, Kennedy was telling people. 
And the biggest failure he ever had in his presidency is the Bay of Pigs. How is the Bay of Pigs as a failure actually something that people look back as a positive for him? Yeah, he took the blame for it. Instead of him being, oh, no, it's his fault, this fault. I mean, in your life, have you seen a president take the blame for something that's been gone wrong? No. Okay, no. Usually it's a, oh, it was here. Whether it be Benghazi, whether it be things that happened in Iraq, all right? I mean, those of you don't remember anything with, with Clinton, uh, that should happen. Basically, that's where. We, you, you, uh, we haven't had this at that time. All right, he took the blame for it. All right, so the, what would be the most thing? And usually when you have some things, the Cuban Missile Crisis, one of the, I mean, the closest we came to World War III, we have a, I mean, you think about the old-fashioned, we're going to meet in the middle street and have a, a shootout. And what happened? Did we lose? No, he won. I mean, basically, he was a tough guy, even though we didn't go launching nuclear weapons. The space race. He said, we're going to... Put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. Did we do it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even though he did not get them successful, was he fighting for civil rights? Fighting for the poor? And what's kind of ironic with this, Kennedy is what was an extremely rich man. So you've got a person that's extremely rich and wealthy that is fighting for the little guy. It's actually a lot like how Franklin Roosevelt was in that way. So people remember them in that way. So even though it may have been a short time, that's why. All right, now for the actual assassination. Occurs in 1963. If you see this, this is the Zapruder. Anybody know what Zapruder is? Or who he is? Guard. He's not a guard. He's not the shooter. No. He was just the guy that came to watch the parade and was going to go by, has a little handheld camera, and happened to film the assassination, what is called the Zapruder film. Uh, then we'll watch some things with, with it later on. But with the Zapruder film, as he's filming, you see this is frame 237, 246. But this is where we, we have an actual footage of when the assassination took place. Um, here, so this is where, with one of the shots, that Kennedy kind of reaches towards his throat. Um, here, this is a, this. I mean, I don't remember how many slides there are per second, but that's basically like not even but a second or so late, later that you have. Here we have Jackie Kennedy roll, going out to the back of it to take a piece of his skull. All right, why does she do that? Nobody knows. Okay, in a time of, tra uh, of something traumatic happening real fast, do you know what you're doing all the time? All right, but she actually went back and grabbed where there was a chunk of the skull that got blown out of, the, out of his head. She actually had grabbed it and had it. She doesn't um, remember doing it, does she? No, no. I mean, she, I mean, this is one of the things things happen. They actually just published a book about they were interviewing the guy who was helping her. Yeah. And it was she was covering him up because she knew that half his head was gone. Right. So I mean, it's, so she was thinking somewhat, but at the same time, how many times did he shot? Did he just shot once? Well, and this is where we kind of get to, and this is where we're going to actually watch a little bit about the magic bullet. And you can also see how history with the movie JFK, and we're not watching a whole movie JFK, all right, it's three hours long, and we couldn't really be allowed to watch it. But we're going to watch a couple clips of it. The most famous scene is the trial scene, and some of you are going to be thinking, ah, oh, there was this great conspiracy. But then I'm going to kind of show you or tell you some other things that here's how a movie can trick you in your thinking also. Oliver Stone was a very good uh, producer and he makes it look and takes things and there's some things like a matter of like there's one scene that you're going to see where he has people lined up and talking about this magic bullet that goes into Kennedy in multiple places about, and you've got to think of it when in all actuality there's a little difference because the seats aren't exactly the way that he has them but What's the magic bullet? Isn't, isn't there um, something like that the CIA killed Kennedy? Like yeah there's all kinds of things that's where I actually have on it all right, before we go into conspiracy theories, for the, soon after, after the assassination, Lee Harvey Oswald is charged with the murder, and I know some of you may have also read, there's some, actually some really interesting things about Lincoln and Kennedy, and there's a lot yeah. of things that are kind of coincidence that come together, uh, yeah. but, uh, but Lee Harvey Oswald is a person that is arrested for it. 
we do not know for sure, and this is where there's a picture of Oswald. Oswald had, had been a Marine. He ends up basically renouncing his citizenship, moves to the Soviet Union. He then comes back with his Soviet wife. Um, there are, and this is what the movie JFK tries to do from one of the conspiracies that our own military, our intelligence and the military was actually the ones that killed Kennedy. Um, there, because was he part of intelligence at that time? Uh, there, there's some things that from what he would have had that he that he may have been hooked with it, but we don't know with Oswald because several days later, and this is a scene where Jack Ruby, who owned a nightclub and there in Dallas, ends up shooting him when they are transporting him in a garage. Conspiracy theorists will say, ah, well, Jack Ruby, he was part of this conspiracy. He was going to, he was killing him. Um, there, be just basically to make it where Oswald is the only one blamed for it. Um, Jack Ruby claimed that he was basically a citizen. He was upset about things and kind of took justice in his own hands. Did he go to what? Did he go to jail? Oh yeah, he went to jail and then he he would never talk after that. There are, it is where we will have we will have investigation done and then the War Commission, our Chief Justice Warren would be in charge of it. They would publish, it's over 20 books when they investigate all these different things where people are at. And when they are said and done, they say that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. Now you asked about the magic bullet. This is where this bullet supposedly moved around and didn't go totally in a straight line. And this is why Oliver Stone makes it look like this bullet comes this way, zigzags, hangs in midair for a little bit, then starts back up again. Kind of makes it seem like that in the movie when explaining the magic bullet. We actually have things that I I have on DHS <coughs> tape, or I had it before. I don't know if it'll, the YBCR even works in here. Um, but this is where the History Channel, they have periodically, they'll come on about things for the Kennedy assassination. But they even show, when we take modern CSI type things in computer generation, a lot of things that the Warren Commission said happen actually can happen, where other people say, no, that wasn't possible for it to happen on there. But there are a lot of conspiracy theories, all right? Besides the military, who are some other groups that people think that might have been involved in the conspiracy? Elvis and two Not Lincoln. Lincoln. All right, communist. Because of the Cuban crush. <laughs> Fidel Castro has been asked about it. Fidel Castro has kind of gave the best answer of all for that. Are you kidding me? Would I actually go and assassinate the president? At that time, was the U.S. looking for any reason whatsoever to invade Cuba? When if they were able to say that Castro killed the president of the United States, would that give us a <laughs> reason to go and invade Cuba? I mean, Castro gave that explanation. There are a lot of people that say it was the Mafia, because Kennedy had done some things and his family had crossed the Mafia um, there, and then the Mafia was the ones that, that killed him. Um, the only thing that's happened here, what usually ends up happening with the Mafia is as they arrest different people, someone usually spills their guts. Do you think over the past 60, 50 years, do you think that somebody that was a part of this might have Don spilled their guts out to save themselves. I mean, I know most of the people in the mafia, they might keep their mouth shut for a lot of things, but if you could save your skin, would you give the information out? As many people have been arrested for things in 50 years from the mafia. Why, why do we have conspiracy theories? And we, more people believe in conspiracy theories now than they did at that time. Huh? Is it just hard for us to think of just one crazy person takes down our president? I mean, that's why. I mean, it, it's one of those things that for us, I mean, it, it's got to be something bigger than that. It just can't be one lone gunman, all right, can take down the president of the United States. So that's why a lot of times people will look and see for conspiracy theory. So, um, and that's one of the autopsy photos there with the part of the Brandon Taylor was talking about where where Jackie was, was trying to hold it in. So, all right, we'll stop there we'll, since we killed Kennedy. The assassination? All right, good. Yeah. After Kennedy was assassinated, Lyndon Johnson was sworn in. This was on the airplane. Jack and Ken Kennedy is with them. Now, Lyndon Johnson, sometimes you'll know him, you'll hear him as LBJ. So this is our uh, 
initials for presidents, FDR. Now, even though Ike isn't his initials, but that's where you can have them short for Ike. Then we have JFK. Now we have LBJ um, there, but he becomes president. Now, he did a lot of things that Kennedy was wanting to have done. He was able to get pushed through Congress. He, Johnson is an in-your-face type of guy. He knows how to twist the arms he, uh, for congressmen and then get them things that, that were done. Part of his ideas were from, remember that book, The Other America? What did Michael Harrington say was wrong in America, The Other America? Or what was The Other America? The poor and the rural. Yeah, poor in the rural area. Where else besides rural? The urban. So basically, we're in the 1950s, we have the suburbs. Well, what about the people that are on the rural area side and which one were left behind in the city? And a lot of Johnson, and this is where you need to know great society. Where we had New Deal, we had Fair Deal, we had New Frontier, great society is Johnson. Um, a lot of conservatives today don't like the idea of great society. The idea they had was the war on poverty. Now, 1964 election, here's where we get kind of, for political science, we look at one of the elections um, in this time period. Um, I'm sticking the folder right there. This one? Yeah. Thank you. Um, but this election, and have I shown you all the days yet? Oh, man. All right, I'll, I'll try to remember just to show you the days he had. For political science, we kind of look at things. And what happens in Daisy the ad? There's this little girl who, who is counting, basically, not um, counting correctly. And then at the end, it basically has an atomic bomb go off. All right, and it was kind of the idea of one of the very first negative political ads and one of the most impactful ones. But we will end up have, having with Barry Goldwater, he is an extreme conservative. Lyndon Johnson, at that time, it was not seen as a negative for the word liberal. And he is trying to help out these people that are poor. He has gone through and pushed things through for civil rights. And what happens in this election is it shows that if you are an extremist in America, you're going to have a hard time winning a generalized election. It will happen again in 1972, but it will be on the other side because we'll have McGovern as an extreme liberal. But Barry Goldwater was more, more conservative. Um, those I'm saying wanting to end TVA, wanting to end Social Security. Um, but not saying, okay, we need to slow down government. He was wanting to go back. Why? Why? This is where we still, in the, in the FDR, we had the conservatives there that said government was too big. It's too much like socialism. Okay, sound familiar for today? Um, there, but this is where and we have this conflict. How much for government do we need? How much for government to take care of our ills of society? Um, but Johnson would end up winning in a landslide. If you see this map, okay, a lot of blue there. One thing that you do look at, though, the Deep South. Remember those old Dixiecrats? They came back to the, to the Democrats for a little bit. But well, they're now Republican. And we'll see starting in 1964, for the most part, from that point on, most of the Deep South would be voting Republican. In 68, a couple of states would have their own candidate in George Wallace. But even today, you kind of look on the map and you see the bottom down there on the map where it has the United States, you'll see the Deep South. It's pretty red um, over there because the Deep South is now the harder Republican Party. It used to be the harder the Democratic Party. Um, all right, great society programs. First of all, we will have health insurance for those 65 and older. Social Security in the, in the Great Depression had taken care of our highest percentage of people that were in poverty, but it got them out of poverty, got them basically where at least we were guaranteeing our older people a sustainable uh, living income. But do old people ever have any health problems? No. no. If most of our health care is done through in private insurances, if you are no longer working, were you going to be able to have health insurance? So this is where the government made a health insurance for people 65 and older. We will then have Medicaid. Medicaid is health insurance for disabled or poor. Get on the bottom. You might have a job, but it, did, but it would be more of a part-time job. 
um, or is a very low paying job and, for a, and you have a skill that they're not providing health insurance. So if you are, like in today's term, making less than $15,000 a year, okay, it gave a chance for this. Um, and so it was expanding and that's part of that war on poverty. When we have this thing about Obamacare and government insurance, Medicare and Medicaid are already government insurance. The Elementary and Secondary Education Act, A2 for school districts. This is where you can kind of look back in history. You may remember the Morrell Land Grant Tax. What were they trying to change? Education for what? Oh, oh. More schools, but what, what focus was that one on? Universities. Universities and with agriculture. Because some of you are farmers. If you were a farmer and your dad was a farmer, but your dad didn't really know how to do things right, part of the idea is let's break this cycle of generation teaching the next generation wrong things. Let's go and teach. Well, if you're in a poor area, are they going to have very good schools? And so this is some of the idea. It's part of the problem that I see here in Citrus County. All right, graduation day is a sad day for me because as I walk see the people walking across the stage and the best and brightest, how many of them will be coming back to Citrus County? five, ten years later. Some of you will say, I want to. I know some of you right now, all right, your goal is to get the heck out of here. But, but for a lot of you, even if you wanted to come back here, are there going to be jobs in your field for you to come back here? So, meanwhile, who are the people that aren't ever going to leave Citrus County? So that's the ones that I see, and I'm going to keep seeing over and over again, while some of you that I would like to see five, ten years from now, all right, you're going to be in other places. I mean, actually, this weekend came across, I mean, it was one of my former students that I had at Crystal River, his parents that have a restaurant, and he's an investment banker in New York City. Um, and, and mother was saying, it's like, I want John to come back and run the restaurant. I'm like, no, John's not gonna come back. To be an investment banker in New York City, come back to Crystal River to run a small business restaurant. It is a family business, but all right, he, he's not going to do that. Is he going to be able to do an investment firm here in Citrus County very good for what he's doing? So it's, it is important. All right, 1965, immigra the Immigration Act, it ends quotas. Remember the Quota Act, the National Origin Act back in the 20s? So we changed this idea. Foundation on the Arts and Humanities. Here's where for government, we, we're kind of getting into the debate now for government. Should the U.S. government be paying for things when it comes to cultural ideas. Should we, should we build, use taxpayer money to build a concert hall? Study of Florida, we actually have a little bit of a different idea also. Should we, right now in the state congress that we have, should we be spending $4 million a year to, to renovate the Miami Dolphins Stadium? Which in Congress, they're kind of looking at, actually, it's over $4 million this year because they're looking to use taxpayer money to reach it. Their idea that they're fighting, the ones legislators fighting for it say, if you fix it up, a Super Bowl, which they're aiming for the, the 50th anniversary of the Super Bowl, if it goes to Miami, will that bring in a lot of money to the city of Miami if you have the 50th Super Bowl? Yeah, but isn't that kind of like this, the thing with the Tampa Bay Bucks? Like, we paid for this stadium. But we can't even watch the And games that's kind of part of the argument that you have on other ways. Plus, for those of you that are going to be going to Florida universities, should maybe that $30 million that they're looking to do, should that maybe be spent on some universities that have had cuts to them over the last 10 years? So, and that's what comes out. Should you be spending money on this? Uh, my wife's from Sarasota. They have the Purple Cow, which is a giant concert hall that they have for your orchestras there. Okay, I mean, should taxpayer money have been spent on that, or should that have been by people donating it? Uh, also, a lot of increase for college, okay, housing assistance, crime prevention, get a lot of things you think of today that the Democratic Party is known for. More expansion of government, this is where the problem comes, because when we have all these things, there is more government. They created what was called the Community Action Programs. Hey, have you ever heard of Head Start? What does Head Start try to do? It's 
with school. He came to school like earlier. Yeah, tries it with students earlier. The idea here is now, if your parents were ones that were able to go when you were two, three, four years old, they may have worked with you at home and they did some things. They read stories to you. They taught you your colors. But for a lot of our, especially our poorest families, did they do that? And the idea of Head Start is, well, let's give them a little bit of a head start so that they can, they can have some of that basics. Um, so when they get to kindergarten, all right, they are on par with the people that have had. Again, trying to break that cycle of poverty. Um, we still have the same argument. President Obama has asked for an expansion of Head Start. Okay, that's one of the things that he is saying that we need to have more of that today. All right, and this is all part of that war on poverty. We established the Department of Transportation as a cabinet position. We would establish the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Now, here's where we'll have, and you'll see this kind of in our civil rights part, we will also have our first African American um, cabinet member, and Robert Weaver. And he seems to be one that people forget the most because a lot of times with first that you have. Uh, but he was our first African-American cabinet, cabinet um, member. Um, we're going to see for the housing and urban development, we'll see this also when we come to the civil rights side, how that comes in again. Um, and try that, that white flight that we had, going back and trying to, to build up things in the cities. All right, two books. Now this, isn't, this is kind of thrown in here, but this is a time period of change and we have influence on it. Mr. Truscott, make you all read Silent Spring. He asked us. He asked you to. Okay. It used to be an assigned reading when you took biology honors. Don't tell Mr. Keckley that. So, it's, <laughs> yeah, the agriculture is a little bit different idea of Silent Spring. Um, but what Silent Spring was, and those of you that aren't sure about it or don't know about it, is the bu book was written, and one of the focus was on the chemical DDT and how it affected, especially like for bald eagles, it made it where their shells were so fragile that then they would break. Um, and a lot of things, and this is where it was kind of exposing where, yes, we had great science, but we were killing other things. Okay, I mean, yeah, we could kill off these bugs that were bad bugs, but we were also killing off birds and eagles that were naturally. Uh, Michael, do you say them back? Okay. Um, but this is where, this would launch the environmental movement. Um, we'll come back to the environmental movement also when we kind of do the counterculture and civil rights. Unsafe at any speed. Ralph Nader, who has run for president a couple different times in recent years for third party, he is a hero to a lot of common people. He wrote this book, um, and he wrote about how GM was making this car, I believe it's a Corvair, um, and it was based, it would blow up. Not as bad as the Pinto. Ford would have their version of blow up cars. <laughs> but we will have this. GM had kind of tried to do a, a slander campaign on him, and he and he ended up suing him, getting millions of dollars. Now, once he got millions of dollars, he didn't spend it on himself. He started a consumer advocacy group. What's a consumer advocacy group? Those units from. Yeah, they would investigate products, try to tell you what's wrong with them, make sure there's safety. And it, you can see why still today we're talking about many, many years later, he's still a hero for people because he didn't take those millions of dollars and spend it on himself. He went and did it where it was for other people. Um, and he ran in 2000 for the Green Party, but 2008 he ran with the Reform Party. Um, but this is where had that idea. All right, Johnson and Civil Rights. And we'll come, when we get to the Civil Rights Unit, we'll come back to you'll see two of these pieces of legislation again. But... JFK had fought for a civil rights bill. Congress ignored him. Johnson comes in, and he kind of uses a guilt trip for Congress. Here's what your dead president wanted. Okay. This is what JFK wanted. You need to vote for it. We'll also have, the year before this, the March of Washington speech. All right, our, and the March of Washington, and then Martin Luther King with the I Have a Dream speech. Um, but I have on here that would be the final straw for many Democrats with the party when they would end up passing the Civil Rights Act. That is why you see that the Deep South ends up going for a Republican party there. But the Civil Rights Act was passed in 1964. The next year was the Voting Rights Act. They also would have federal support of the Civil Rights. We would be sending in Robert Kennedy to make sure that there was support. 
we actually have the news right now that the the uh, Supreme Court is looking whether or not we need to continue with the Voting Rights Act uh, where there are certain states in the South that are monitored to make sure they are not doing anything to suppress the vote of minorities. And in um, Alabama, a county there is sued saying, we don't need to be regulated anymore. Okay, and they had the oral arguments last week on the Supreme Court. They'll make the ruling um, sometime in the near future. All right, Johnson's legacy. You're going to see when we, when we do Vietnam, that's where we're going to see a lot of stuff with Johnson. But his great society programs, all right, there were things that, that he did, um, pushed through law after law. I have on here, what was it, a success? Did we eliminate poverty? No. But anyone know what happened with poverty under Johnson? Yeah, we basically cut it in half in one decade. So it depends on how you want to look at things. If you cut the number of people living below the poverty line in half, is that pretty good? I mean, we're not talking about a long period, one decade. But again, the goal was to eliminate it. Uh, I have, what are the positives? All right, a lot of the civil rights reform. And this is where Johnson, even today, there's a Depending on who you talk to for Johnson, a lot of times it'll depend if they're Vietnam or not, all right, what their viewpoint was Vietnam. But this is where, for civil rights, he did so much for civil rights. How about Medicare? Good. Yeah, I mean, it's seen as a positive program. Now, for your generation, <laughs> you all may not like a lot of things with Medicare because y'all are going to be paying a whole lot more for it than the and the people that are getting the benefits right now. Is that is it the same thing as Social Security where you just pay into it and then the idea is you get it back? Right, except for right it? now, the people that are collecting Medicare actually get, including inflation, basically three times the amount that they paid into it. And then what Part about? Part of that's because health care has increased as so much. And then so our baby boomer population is all getting well, to that But what about age. Medicaid? You don't pay into that. All right. Medicaid, no, you don't pay into that. That's where it comes from government taxes, some local, some state. That's where we actually have the whole issue right now because Obamacare was going expanded Medicaid, what we would call the working poor, people that are working a job but can't get health insurance. But one of the problems that you have is, well, if I actually quit work, I can get Medicaid for my health problems. But do I want to actually, do I want to work? So we kind of put people, some people on the, on the bubble. Well, the idea that we expanded this, and this here in the state of Florida, we have a, where Governor Scott said last, last week that he was going to accept the things for the expansion of, of Obamacare. Meanwhile, our state house, Speaker of the House, Will Weatherford said, no, we're not going to do that. So we're going to have a political battle of whether or not we do it. Will we have people that are don't have insurance that need health care in Florida? Mm. Okay, yeah. Now the question is, will Obamacare do what it says it's going to do? They say that they say with Obamacare that the first three years they'll pay hundred percent of that expansion and after that ninety percent. All right, Will Weatherford says, no, we don't trust the federal government for doing that. Rick Scott says we're going to have to pay for it one way or the, or another. Either people that are Taxpayers in Florida are going to have to pay for it, so we might as well get the federal money coming in. So, and that's good. It's kind of the same things, arguments on there. Now, what are the negatives of the Great Society program? So, people thought like it was a, it was like a Waste expansion of, of government. Like, yeah. well, that's the biggest thing: expansion of government. Less tax, like coming in from well, the government, like more tax coming out. Well, you're, you're more spending, which you have to then increase your taxes to pay for that. So, any negatives when people think of welfare? Do we have moochers? Yeah, they're, yes. they're, they're like them. Do we have people that abuse the system? Yeah. yeah, and this is where you kind of look at. Now, I will tell you, this is where the, the people that are the moocher class is not as big as some people think. The problem is, when you do have that small percentage of people that are pretty much cheating, all right, and you're doing right, doesn't that tick you off? And that's what happens when you have things um, there. So, oh, 
the negatives you think of is basically the whole negative you think of when it comes to the whole welfare system. All right. I have the question, what would be the reason the focus would go off the Great Society program in the late 1960s? Anyone know? Vietnam. Yeah, Vietnam. The Vietnam conflict had gotten so big that it's like, all right, we got to take care of this problem. And another thing is, is war expensive. Can we pay for a war on the other side of the world and pay for a war on poverty at the same time? And that's what Lyndon Johnson was trying to do. And 1968, when he could have run for re-election, because he started after that halfway point of Kennedy in his first term. So he could have gone for four more years. He decided not to. Why did he decide not to? He didn't want to deal more time right that. He wanted to come out with a big, like a good, not a bad one. Well, he comes out with a negative. This is where, let's go back to Bracking days. Anybody remember 1968? T T T T This will be the battle that will kind of change things because that's kind of the downturn in Vietnam. So the two questions kind of have the same answer. It's Vietnam. Although he's doing things that a lot of people like in America with the Great Society programs, the Vietnam becomes so big by 1968 that he says he will not seek, which the Democrats he put probably wouldn't have got the nomination. Um, and I said, I know we haven't got to the Vietnam yet, but that's where you kind of look and see. And I kind of put Vietnam, not just with each president. I kind of go with Vietnam as one big thing. All right, the Warren Court. This is where you're going to get, this is the other Supreme Court justice you really have to know. Marshall's the main one. Warren's the second one that you had. A lot of civil rights cases. Remember Brown versus Board of Education. What case is overturned? Plessy versus yeah, Ferguson. Said that segregation was illegal and... Um, public in public places. We will then have Baker versus Carr, and I'll actually come back to this when we do the civil rights section also in here, but this is where for reapportionment comes down to, and the idea of what is called one man, one vote. Heart of Atlanta versus Motel, Heart of Atlanta Motel versus the United States. This is where that Civil Rights Act comes in. We will actually go and have it where it is supported by the Supreme Court, Segregation not just in public places, but if you are a restaurant, a hotel, you're not allowed to have segregation. And again, I'll have that when we do the civil rights again on there. For some of you, some of you know you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. Hopefully it's from watching that on TV and movies that you know that and you don't know it because Mr. Police Officer has been telling you. That is... The Miranda rights, which I will tell you that it's you can kind of lump these all together of knowing the rights for the accused. Miranda says that basically you are to be told of your rights. Uh, the Gideon case says you have the right to a lawyer. Escobedo says you have the right for your lawyer to be with you when you're being questioned. So basically all these are rights that they have for the accused. So the Warren Court is not just civil rights. The rights of the accused are the other thing that, that, that you have on the that. And that will be the end for that section. Yeah.